from the heart of rural France. This is the Keto Woman podcast, brought to you by me. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. I've been keto now for over two years and it has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs under 20 grams a day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like full fat dairy. Choose delicious fatty proteins and be free and easy with oily dressings on salad and butter on your veggies. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. You'll hear all sorts of ways to keto from my guests. There is no one way to do keto, no one size fits all. I hope to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we really can't give you medical advice. It's always best to consult your own doctor when making big changes to your diet and lifestyle because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Wouldn't it be helpful to have one place where you could find all the links? Want to sign up to my new Patreon exclusive Facebook group, Daisy's Lovelies? No problem. How about subscribing to my YouTube channel? Please help me notch up my first thousand subscribers by going to links.ketowomanpodcast.com and following the YouTube link. Not following me on Instagram yet? Hit the Instagram button. You get the idea. All the buttons, all the links you need are at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Before we get started, I just want to remind you about Monday Mindset. If things go according to plan, the first episode after the introduction will be out on Monday. Of course, I left things a little bit last minute and I'm now waiting on Apple Podcasts to give it the go ahead. So fingers crossed. I've been registering the intro with other platforms though, like Stitcher, Spotify and Google Play. So look out for it there. I'll also be putting the intro episode on the Keto Woman feed over the weekend so you can find out what it's all about then. I hope some of you will give it a go and enjoy listening as much as Terry and I have enjoyed recording. Happy weekend and I hope you're all doing okay wherever you are in this weird COVID world we're living in right now. Back to business and welcome to episode number 136 where I'm joined by extraordinary woman Amy Igers. Amy is a health coach and reformed chronic dieter who is passionate about helping others recover from the diet binge gain shame cycle she struggled with for years. Since discovering a ketogenic and low-carb lifestyle, she has lost over 180 pounds and has both reversed pre-diabetes and resolved lifelong depression. She says, When I was just starting out, facing 200 pounds to lose seemed insurmountable, and the idea I would ever be where I am now was unfathomable. Know this, I am no different than anyone else reading this, or listening in this case. I'm not exceptional. I just finally got the right advice, put one foot in front of the other and didn't look back. I know now that it can be done, but after battling this war for 40 years, I had lost hope that it was really, truly possible. I am living proof that it is. If you want to work with Amy, you can find out how to get in touch with her by going to the show notes at ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash 136 or click the latest episode button on the links page at links.ketowomanpodcast.com. Sometimes when I'm interviewing a guest, I find myself nodding in agreement to experiences that I have shared. This was one of those interviews. I often also find myself falling in love a bit with my guests. I get so involved and interested in their stories. 
This was no exception. And I think you are going to fall head over heels for Amy too. Welcome, Amy, to the Keto Women podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me, Daisy. It's quite an honor. Well, it's lovely to chat to you. We've been talking for a while about you coming on the podcast, so it's nice to get you here today. Looks like you've got a nice sunny day there in New York. It's getting there. It's a little dreary right now, which given the, the quarantine situation, I don't mind so much. It makes things a little easier when the weather is a little gray as opposed to when it's sunny. So I don't mind it so much makes it easier to be inside. What's it been like there? Because you're really in the thick of it there. It's been a hot spot in this yeah. weird COVID world we're living in in the moment. Well, that perfectly describes it. It's a weird COVID world right now. Um, you know, Manhattan feels very dystopian right now. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I, I work from home most of the time, so I didn't have to get used to that part of it. But being outside, going for walks feels a little bleak a lot of stores are boarded up most are closed uh, a couple of restaurants are doing some takeout but it's really it is a little creepy i have to say um i think they're showing some signs of life coming back a couple of places are open essential services are are open but and everybody's masked up and everybody's being very cautious but um, you know, as New Yorkers, we're used to kind of a lots of populations kind of gathering around us and being around us and near us at all times. And mm. and people are starting to, or not starting, we're doing this for three months now, but people are feeling a little paranoid about people coming up from behind them or you just, you get a little jumpy, a little, everybody's kind of eyeing each other. Like, are you sick? Are you sick? It's just, it feels a little dystopian. Mm. So... I don't know what the normal is going to look like. I don't know what new normal is going to look like, but I'm I'm ready for it in many ways. Yeah, it must be very strange. You know, I live in quite a quiet part of the world, so yes, things are things are opening up again here. It's I went out yesterday and it's actually looking sort of quite busy again, so it all looks pretty normal apart from people wearing masks and people are being obviously quite thoughtful of each other and things but I'm not used to the hustle and bustle of somewhere like New York and I can remember having visited it uh, when was it was it last year the year before last mm -hmm. when I was in New York and it was you know everything I imagined with just being so full of people and busy and the hustle and the bustle and the jostling against people yeah. on you know on on the sidewalks and so I, I imagine the stark difference must be very very difficult to get used to it is I, mean, I don't live in an area that is normally hustle and bustle but it on the weekends, there's there's some touristy stuff not too far from where I live, and it's very crowded this time of year, especially as the weather gets nicer. Mm. Uh, and there's just none of that. I have to say, I don't mind that so much. It's the neighbors that I miss. You know, it's it's walking the dog and sort of catching up with people throughout our day, and mm. that part feels a little, little sad. You know, that there's ways a touchstones that you don't kind of have uh, mm. during the day, especially if you work from home. When you go out and walk the dog a couple of times a day, you have touchstones to people in the neighborhood. How are you? How's your dog doing? And, you know, you run into people now occasionally when you're out for walks, but it's not the same. And at night, it feels creepy because it's so desolate. Mm. So that part, you know, I'm not, uh, I lived here for a very long time, so I'm not used to being so scared or, or you know, there's a certain level of caution that you have living here all the time. I guess maybe it's kind of inherent in, in just being here and, or maybe intuitive is the right word. But um, but so I'm not used to having that be so forefront in my mind. And over the last couple of months, it's become more apparent just the lack of foot traffic at night. It's brought out a little bit of a seedier element. Stores are boarded up. There's restaurants and bars aren't open. So there's not the, even that traffic. That part feels creepy. So not doing a lot of evening strolls. No. <laughs> you know, this too shall pass, we hope. Yes. Who knows when, but it's it's certainly a very difficult thing to get used to and get your head around. And, and you realize how many 
little things that you took for granted yeah. you just forgot happened like you mentioned those touchstones if you know if you'd sat down and thought about listing them all out before this happened you, you probably wouldn't have even thought of them and certainly not necessarily thought of them as as being of paramount importance but yeah. something like this really changes your perspective on a lot of things I think it does you know I'm a little bit of a loner in general and so me too I didn't have a massive adjustment to certain parts of this, logistical parts of this, but it's made me really appreciate, like I just, you know, I I don't think I'll ever complain. Well, I don't say ever because I know that, you know, six (laughs) months back to normal and I'll be complaining about (laughs) having too many social plans or, or having to go somewhere, you know, that I'm, you know, rolling my eyes about. But um, it's made me appreciate the fact that, my grocery is, store is filled with, filled with food that I can go and get things that I need at a moment's notice. Just the little things in life that we take for granted, like the infrastructure that mm-hmm. is required for my supermarket to be filled and for the pharmacy yeah. to be filled and for essential services to be taken care of. I mean, I was appreciative of those things before, but you know, in the morning when I walk my dog and I see the grocery store workers unpacking the produce and the food, I just want to kiss them, you know, through my mask. I yeah, just, I'm yeah. just so grateful that these people are working and that, you know, so I guess that part's good that there's, we've developed this appreciation for people that keep our lives afloat. Mm. Um, not just our hairdressers and our nail salons and our, and all that luxury stuff, but really the necessities are, are I'm very lucky that I, I live in a place where that hasn't affected me. And I'm grateful for it. So that part's a nice thing that I have an appreciation for that. Yeah, I hope that kind of thing carries on that that we don't just go back to taking all those things for granted. And for sure. just just like you say, all all those kind of people too to many are, are just sort of unnoticed, aren't they? Mm-hmm. And and not thought of as essential but of course they are essential of course everyone's essential but it, it's just nice that it really makes you appreciate everyone yeah i agree and then every night i don't know if this is still happening in other cities but every night at seven o'clock everybody in manhattan opens their window and kind of just starts to applaud for healthcare workers or other essential workers mm-hmm. banging pots and bells and screaming mm-hmm. and just you know the other night a woman uh, a neighbor, an anonymous neighbor who I don't know, just was, she must be an opera singer. And she just started singing this beautiful aria out of her window at 7.03, just as everybody was stopping their applause. And it was, everybody stopped for a moment and kind of listened. And then when she was done, everybody applauded for her. It was really kind of lovely. And I don't know who she is. I don't know what she looks like. It was just from an, one anonymous window in Manhattan, and it was sort of beautiful. Mm. And that applause for the healthcare workers every night, it feels really lovely. I think that's become a touchstone for people mm. every night, that people are working from home all day and on their Zoom calls all day. And, and, and every night at seven o'clock, there's just like a, a release of enthusiasm and appreciation for all of these people mm. that are keeping us afloat. Mm, and a, a real moment of connection, isn't it? Yeah. Both to them and just to everyone else. Yeah, it really is. Mm, nice, I, I like I that. Think people have come to look forward to it every night. Mm. Although I have to say, I'm, I hope the appreciation stays, but I'm ready for us to emerge from our own personal purgatory. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I think most people are getting to that point. Yeah. Very tricky, <laughs> especially as the weather is improving. I mean, it's been lovely here for a while, actually. But like you say, it's it's a bit more easy when it's when it's not too nice outside. But when it's a, that lovely day that pushes people who live in a place where... Mm-hmm the weather can be so changeable that when it's nice, everyone is driven outside. It's always like that in the UK. Less at where I am in, in France, the weather tends to be a lot better more of the time. But the UK has this reputation for having horrendous weather. Yeah. So when it's nice, there's this lovely sort of holiday feeling that, <laughs> yeah. that just wraps itself around everyone and everyone wants to be outside and everyone you know you feel the mood lifting and things so uh, you know with all this happening and it that sort of having a dampening effect it's it's difficult to see how we're going to manage that balance heading into the summer yeah i have to say it's been a little bit easier here in new york because it's been so unseasonably cold 
Uh, we've had one or two nice spring, beautiful days, but for the most part, it's been really cold and dreary and rainy. And I, I do, um, I'm a little nervous about what's going to happen when, when it starts mm. to be sunny and warm consistently. You know, on the days that it has been and you walk outside, uh, it feels a little like the birds and the flowers are mocking us. You know, we're all walking <laughs> out with masks and all the birds and flowers are sunshiny and and feel like they're mocking us because they're free and we're not. It feels a little dystopian. So it'll be curious to see what happens and how people start to behave when spring really kicks in in full bloom. Mm. I'm very fortunate where I live. You know, I, I live in the countryside and I have quite a lot of land around me. And at the moment, I have all these rambling roses that are going oh, lovely. mad. And so the air is just full of the scent of roses. And oh, it's, but it, nice. That has all made me really appreciate a lot more where yeah. I live. You know, I've I've had times, especially when my mood has been down, where, you know, I haven't enjoyed being here and things. But this year I've it's really made me appreciate where I live. So that's nice. You know, yeah. it, it's we all are, are learning different things about ourselves, where we live, our relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. It's it's although it's a, it's a very scary and worrying time. I, it's very interesting as well. I think I've found a lot of things that you know just to find fascinating about it. Yeah, it's it has been a learning experience. I think mm. um, you know we've got to sort of figure out what we're made of in some ways. Mm. You know, very fortunate that um, my problems are mostly logistical and yeah. don't have, thankfully, I'm healthy. Everybody in my immediate world is healthy, but I do recognize that I am really blessed. There's, you know, especially in New York, the, the hospital's been really overrun. The, the death counts are just mind blowing, just really mind blowing. So, mm. um, yeah, I recognize that I have luxury problems in this. And that I, I can, you know, sort of reevaluate and, and learn things about myself. Just the fact that I'm healthy enough to do that is, is really, I'm very blessed. Absolutely. I think we, we all become much more appreciative of, of things that we took for granted before. And yeah, that's, that's definitely a good thing. But enough talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> what we're here is to find out about you. So perhaps you could tell us about you. I was overweight as a very young child, and it was kind of a theme in our family. Uh, my mother was very overweight. My grandmother was very overweight. My grandmother used to go to Duke University every year. This is before Eric Westman was there, and she would do something called a rice diet. Mm. Which, uh, <laughs> it's no wonder that she had to go back every year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was very much a theme. Most of my siblings are, are overweight, and... I guess I was the youngest and sort of all trickled down to me. But so I had the biggest problem in the family besides my mother. And it was very much a theme I, because I was so young. My parents and I lived outside of New York City at the time. So there were lots of resources either in Manhattan or, or elsewhere for doctors and diets and so-called experts to help me. And my parents really, to their credit, they tried everything that they could to help me lose weight and it just it nothing ever worked you know I was constantly going to nutritionists and dietitians and I tagged along to Weight Watchers with my mother I think I was maybe six maybe seven years old something like that wow. I tagged along to my first meeting with her I wasn't a member of Weight Watchers but I remember going with her and I remember the woman that did the weighing and I was at the front counter spelled something out to my mother that started with an O and I, of course, I was really young and I didn't know what it spelled. But even at like six or seven, I, I had already internalized that message that she was calling me fat. Mm. You know, later I know she was probably spelling obese or overweight or something like that. But I, even though I didn't know what she was spelling, I knew that she was basically saying that I was fat. And um, yeah, and that just was one part of, of just this intractable problem that I could never get a handle on. But I was always trying I mean, I just was, there was always a diet. I was, and I was morbidly obese by the time I was probably 10, 12 years old. Wow. I don't know what exactly, I don't remember exactly what my weights were at that point. But I know by the time I went to college, so about 18, uh, I was 
already living for years, probably over 300 pounds, uh, and it uh, went up from there. And and this is despite constantly trying. I joined Weight Watchers, this is a low estimate, easily 35 times over the course of my life. You know, so my parents tried everything to help me, including sending me to weight loss camps, including spending countless dollars and countless time and energy on helping, trying to get me to the right quote unquote expert. And it never worked. And then as an adult, I continued that sort of hit my head against a wall, try to figure out how to get a handle on this. I just thought I was broken. I just thought I was just completely, there's something wrong with me. And and so I did have some depression along the way, but I think it was exacerbated by the fact that I was living in this body that I didn't know how to deal with and how to handle. Mm. So I just tried everything and it never, nothing ever worked. And I just thought I, I am broken and this is, this is how I'm going to live. And did you find, you know, did it, did any of it work even sort of temporarily? Was it a case of, you know, going on a diet, losing a bit of weight and then it coming back again? Or was there just sort of no impact really at all? I would lose, I would, I I was in this really sort of sick cycle. So I would lose, I would start Weight Watchers every January or some program every January. I would lose maybe 30, 40 pounds. And I probably had about 200 to lose. So it just never seemed like enough. Mm. But for whatever reason, I would do it in January. I would lose the 30, 40 pounds. And then by the spring, I would be off of the diet because I just couldn't sustain it. Mm. So come May, June, July, I would start to dabble more and I would go off of it and I would gain the 30, 40 pounds plus a couple of friends by the fall. Yeah, that's always a nice little side effect, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. only gain what you lose, but a bit more. You bring Thanks. a couple. Of, yeah, you bring some more. <laughs> <with> you. <Yeah. laughs> and then, you know, then, then it would be the holidays or it'd be Thanksgiving and then and, and, the states or christmas and i would say oh i'm not gonna start i'll start in january and then you know rinse and repeat just over it over and over Mm -hmm. and i was in this like pathetic awful cycle for decades just for decades i mean then it was mostly weight watchers or some variation of calories in calories out points in points out but but there were other things along the way i mean i i tried a medically supervised fasting program a couple of times twice i think where I lost maybe 60 or 70 pounds. And, you know, we know from sort of the Oprah effect what happens when you do those fasting programs, which really just fasting. There's no feasting. You're not really introducing any calories into your system. Mm. And so I would lose the 60 or 70 pounds, and then the weight just came, like, screaming back after those. Uh, there was just no way to sustain those. And, and you know, when you're losing the weight like that and you're doing something so invasive to lose the weight, you're kind of in a little bit of a honeymoon phase during the weight loss, and it's just so wonderful. You're in this like amazing space of, I'm losing weight. I feel so great. And then the gaining of the weight back is just the most excruciating process because you just feel like, oh, I am such a damn failure again. It just, it was the worst. It was really it was the worst. Because, of course, it's got to be you, right? It's got to be your fault. Oh, yeah. Of course <laughs> that's, that's my That's always fault. the assumption. There's, there's no, it's not anybody else. It's me. You yeah. know, it's got to be my fault. Yeah, well, every expert says moderation is the thing. Every expert mm. says just count your calories, exercise, move more, just stop. Just eat a little bit of this and just moderate yourself. What's wrong with you? Why can't you moderate? Yeah. Uh, and I doesn't, it never dawned on me to question the bigger picture of maybe the advice is wrong. Yeah. It just never dawned on me. And eventually I found my way to the whole intuitive eating process and the health and any size movement. And I have to say, they get a lot of crap from some in the low carb world. But I think there's a lot of value there. Mm, me too. It ultimately, it's doing intuitive eating. I ended up gaining weight doing it because in retrospect, now that I have discovered keto and low carb, I don't think that there's any way for me to do intuitive eating while I'm riding the glucose sugar roller coaster and I need to feed myself every two hours. Mm -hmm. But it at least offered me some modicum of peace around the issue that I stopped beating myself up and stopped saying, this is all your fault. 
But that part was helpful. And ultimately, it taught me that I deserve to feel good in my body, that I, and certainly with the health at any size movement, I wish that we could rebrand that or remarket it as healthier at any size, because I think that's a really a message that every doctor should wrap their head around that, you know, you can see a patient that is 400 pounds and just, they might be healthy at that size, but they can be healthier. And shouldn't that be the goal? Little steps to get them healthier. Mm. So those things, the intuitive eating and the healthier or healthy at any size movement taught me that feeling good in my body is not just a luxury that should be afforded to thin people, that I deserve to feel good in it and that I deserved. It got me started exercising even at my highest weight. Those are skills that having discovered keto and low carb and having some success with it have been really instrumental in helping me, but not in the way that I first use them at those points. It wasn't until I eliminated carbs. Yes, I, th- I think that's very interesting. And I, you know, I came across similar things and I can't for the life of me remember the name of the book. It's on my shelf over there. But I went through a similar process. You're completely right about what you were saying is that there are sort of pros and cons to it. But there's there's definitely a lot of value to be taken from it. And I can't for the life of me remember the po- name of the podcast I was listening to. But the point that they were trying to make, they were talking about weight loss and taking the responsibility for that on yourself and deciding to make that change. Mm -hmm. But what they were talking about that was absolutely key before you could make that change was starting in a place of acceptance and compassion and love for how you are now. 100%. And it's only from that place that you can, you can start that change because you know that's that change is going to be hard and you you can't do it from a place of guilt and shame and self-loathing how how can you possibly drum up the necessary determination and motivation if you hate yourself you can't how can you expect anyone to do that why would you if you hate yourself so much why would you why would you take all of do all of the hard work that's necessary to make a change you know the thing that um that i say all the time to people is like i could never hate myself enough to get myself healthy Mm. It just self-loathing never worked for me. I no. tried it for 40 plus years. I, I mean, I hated myself so much. And every part of the weight loss mechanism of the weight loss industry told me that I should hate myself. Mm. And yet it, it landed me pretty damn near close to 400 pounds. So I could never hate myself then. I could never say hate myself enough to be healthy. And Accepting yourself doesn't necessarily mean that you want to accept everything about yourself. It means no. It means that you are you accept yourself to say there's something better for me out there and I deserve to find it. I credit that mentality with why I kept trying and trying despite having so many failures along the way. Mm. That acceptance really was instrumental. Mm. It's one of the things I get very upset about, actually, when I see the very typical before and after comparison. You've got a fantastic one. Thank you. I actually put it out a few weeks ago. I'll, I'll put it out again in your week. What I get upset about is when people say things when they post those pictures of themselves and they say things, I'm never going to be like that. I hated oh, I that yeah. way I was then. I'm, I'm never going to let myself get like that again. I, you know, all this, this negative talk about that before picture and it just makes me cry oh, inside I and so cry. often outside too because, because that part, that woman that you're seeing there, that you know, obese woman, that woman that had health issues, whatever it was that that you're looking at, she's still a part of you. She's in there. You and, and when she you start you ta- to this point, absolutely. When you start talking about her like that, she's in there screaming in pain, and she's actually the one that will quite often 
feel all that guilt and shame and and then you'll you'll start maybe wondering why you suddenly get these images of cake and ice cream and things in your head Isn't well that's that her miraculous? giving you a message because yeah. she's 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 feeling so bad and and i just say to people i want you to look at her and say wow look at her look at the courage look at the determination mm -hmm. she's the one who got me from there to that after picture that everyone's going, wow, you look so amazing. Yeah. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. So I think we, we really need to rebrand that before picture I so agree. <laughs> as the wonder woman that she is. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's a double-edged sword. Well, that's my, maybe not the right word, but it's, it's a little bit of a showing those before and after pictures is helpful because I think that they are inspiring. I certainly was inspired Absolutely. by them, you mm. know, in just scrolling through Facebook pages and, and online when I was first starting out, just knowing that it's actually, it's just a very physical, mm. tangible way to say, oh, this is possible. Yeah. And that's why I put them out there now sometimes because I'm not somebody that really likes, is all that comfortable being public with this. I mean, and there's a number of reasons why I am becoming a little more vocal in public about this now. But I think that those before and after pictures, I agree with you. When people comment and, and make rude comments about the person that I look like before, well, and, and this may come with age and being, you know, I have reclaimed my health at a point in my life where I've done some internal work, where I've done the work, where I can say, it's not just about the superficial. It's it's about how I feel in my body every day that I can move and I can am mm. it healthy. My health numbers are good. I, I you know I've experienced the loss of both parents to ill health and I uh, I'm just so grateful that I can move around in my body that no longer feels like a prison. And that to me is way more important than the actual picture. But I do think those pictures are very valuable because what I always want people to know about me is that I wasn't exceptional in terms of weight loss. But I was exceptional as I, as I failed so many times, like many of us. But that's not exceptional. I think what was exceptional is that I just kept trying. Mm. And I want people to know that just trying and keeping on trying until you find the way that's right for you, that it's possible. And I just... I had lost so much hope. I just, I didn't think it was at all a possibility for me anymore. I was 50, I think I was, well, how old was this? I was about 49 when I started and that's four decades of, of intractable weight issues of living in a prison. I, I wrote a blog post recently for Dr. Tro where I wrote, I referred to my body as living in a uh, living a death row prison sentence for a crime it didn't commit. And I think that that is the best way that I can describe it. I just, my body felt like a prison, but I didn't know why I was living in prison when I kept maintaining my innocence. And I really just was getting terrible advice from so many people. And so what those before and after pictures, I hope show people is that it is possible, not because I'm exceptional, but because because I kept trying mm. till I found my way. And it sounds like that there were various steps to finding that way that worked for you. You know, you, you've already mentioned the things about, that obviously started you down this track of self-acceptance and more self-love, that mm -hmm. even just starting with that triggered things like maybe wanting to move more and things like that. So what came next? What was it that yeah. that led you to find low carb and keto? Or was there another step before that? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember all the the exact steps, but I so I, I did Weight Watchers for many years or some variation and then I found my way to intuitive eating and the health of any size movement. And I did discover exercise even at my highest weight. I found joy in movement and in yoga and that exercise felt really good. And I think that was partially responsible for why I didn't have worse health issues, even though I was pushing 400 pounds. Um, and then uh, my mother passed away very suddenly from congestive heart failure. It was a direct result of type 2 diabetes. And it gutted me. I mean, my, you know, I was, we were very close and I 
her death really devastated me. And the fact that it was a result of type 2 diabetes and that I was already pre-diabetic, I just knew that, the, I mean, the handwriting was on the wall. There was just no way that I was not fast forward five, six, seven years that I was not going to be a full-blown diabetic. And not to mention, as I said before, that, you know, my body was just a prison sentence. It just was, it was a death row sentence and I couldn't move around comfortably. And I was starting to really, uh, the depression was taking hold. And so I went through the grieving process and uh, after my mother passes away and I go back to Weight Watchers with renewed energy and vigor because that's the smart, sensible, moderate way to go. And I'm going to conquer this once and for all. And once again, went through the same cycle of, you know, lose the 30 pounds, start to go off. And I thought, all right, here we go again. And I was really just desperate. And I made an appointment with a bariatric surgeon. And I should preface this by saying, I fully respect people that have bariatric surgery. I think it's a viable amazing tool for people that want to go that route. I just didn't think intellectually or emotionally that it was the right decision for me. I knew I had food addiction issues and I had seen other people go through the process and then they ended up gaining the weight back. And I, because I had done some therapy, I knew that if I, even if I had the bariatric surgery, that I would ultimately gain the weight back because I was, it was not going to deal with what I needed to deal with, which was really my internal stuff. That's very perceptive and a very courageous step to to take, a very courageous decision to make, actually, because in a lot of ways, that would have been the easiest route to follow and just ignore that nagging voice in your head that was saying, I know ultimately long term, this won't be the right solution for me. But even with that, you would have known that short term, it would definitely have worked. Mm -hmm. So that was a very brave decision to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Well, it wasn't that brave yet because I, <laughs> I did make the appointment with the doctor. <laughs> but what, yeah, it, but it took me a very long time to make the appointment. But I, I just didn't think it was right for me. And so I, I made the appointment and then somebody mentioned low carb or keto to me and I was shocked that it was something that I'd never really heard of or that I'd never really explored. And maybe that was because, I mean, I'd heard of Atkins because growing up, I think my, I remember my mother trying Atkins for a while, but you know, from so much of mainstream medicine, Atkins is just like, Oh my God, you're going to die from all that bacon. How could you do that? It's butter and steak. <laughs> and, and so I was always scared to try it. Cause I thought, Oh, that's a fad diet. Anyway. So I, somebody mentioned their success with low carb to me and I had two weeks to wait before I had the appointment with the surgeon. And I started Googling, went onto the website, onto Diet Doctor. Somehow I stumbled across it and they had a two week challenge. And I thought, all right, I'm going to try this for two weeks because even if I do get bariatric surgery, I'm going to have to drastically change the way I eat. And I don't believe it in any way for me because I feel like I, I'm definitely, I definitely have a food addiction issue. And so I have to get to the bottom of this, whether I have bariatric surgery or not. So let me try this two-week challenge. Also, I think I was scared of the surgery, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> so I tried their two-week challenge, and I I remember like really doing a deep dive on Diet Doctor, looking at every video, every blog, every everything I could find online in that two weeks. And I thought, oh my God, this makes complete sense. Like, I don't speak quote unquote science. I, it's not my first language, but I could see that it was just all right there. It just made complete sense. And I thought, how come nobody told me this? I have been to hundreds of doctors. I've been to every doctor in the New York tri-state area who's a quote unquote weight loss expert. And not one of them ever mentions doing low carb to me. Never. Not one time. So I did it for two weeks. I started to feel better. You know, I was still looking at 200 pounds to lose. So there was no amount of weight I could lose in that two weeks that was going to make me feel like I hadn't really made any headway yet. But I could tell right away that there was something, there was a shift. Now I understand what that shift was and that it was just, you know, not riding that glucose roller coaster up and down mm. to hell. But I could tell right away there was something profound about it. Yeah, and it, it put you in a place where suddenly you could see that actually it is possible after decades of, you know, keep trying and keep trying, but 
with that sort of inevitability that it's just not going to work mm -hmm. suddenly it sounds like you there was like this just this light bulb moment ah okay and you you could see the light at the end of the tunnel I could you know you knew it was going to take a while because like you say you can't you can't lose 200 pounds in right. in a very short space of time it's going to take time but you could see that this was something that you could stick to until it worked. Yeah. And it, it felt intrinsically different to me right away. And part of that actually was to your point earlier that we were talking about is looking at all of those before and after pictures on Diet Doctor mm. because they seemed, they did seem to be real people. It wasn't just some splashy magazine cover where I lost a hundred pounds. Like these seemed to be real people that had battled this in a way that I had. And I found that really inspirational and hopeful. And that plus the science that Diet Doctor presented in a way that was incredibly user-friendly for people like me that don't necessarily speak science as their first language. And then that also that feeling right away of not having cravings, of being able to not white knuckle it and be hungry all the time. Uh, so all of those things combined, I think, really helped me in the beginning to say, oh, this, this is different. This is not like all the other times. So yeah, that was, that was how I started and discovered keto. So once I passed that initial phase, I canceled the, the appointment with the surgeon. I continued to lose a little bit of weight, but I also, and I did a deep dive into all of the keto websites and blogs and all the information out there. And it became so overwhelmed with mm. all of the conflicting keto mm. information, even in the among, among the low carbers, I found it almost paralyzing because, oh, this one's doing high fat and this one's doing low fat and this one's doing more protein and you should have this and you should fast and you should, and it became completely overwhelming as opposed to if I just kind of stuck to put the blinders on and kept where I was going. So I ended up early on reaching out to, um, I knew that I needed to find somebody that could guide me and that I could believe in as to sort of cut through a lot of the BS. And um, that person who I discovered kind of randomly through a diet doctor interview is somebody who I know is also near and dear to your heart is Kim Howerton. Mm. So uh, she, she was my health coach very early on. She's very good at cutting through the crab, isn't she? <laughs> she I know you're, you're absolutely right in that it's paralyzing because there is so much conflicting information and you don't know which one is right. So I think you're right. The only thing mm -hmm. you can do is to find a person that you can trust yeah. and just listen, listen to what they say and cut out all the rest of the noise. Right. Just let them be a safety net and kind mm. of, you know, decipher where you should go and where you shouldn't. And so I reached out to her and um, it was really kind of random how I even found her because she didn't have that much of an online presence at the time. Now she does. But, uh, you know, she kind of had a, a similar sensibility as I do. She's got a wicked sense of humor, mm -hmm. um, which kind of works for me. And so, yeah, so I started, I started working with her as my coach and she gave me a really invaluable education about nutrition and keto and clean ingredients versus dirty ingredients and why I should eliminate seed oils and things like that. And of course, I followed it up with doing some more research on my own and doing a lot of reading and doing a lot of delving into it, but she gave me really an incredible and invaluable education and foundation that has really stood me well all these years and helped me cut through all the BS that was out there. So I owe her a debt of gratitude. Mm -hmm. So that was about three years ago, a little, actually March would, will be three plus years. March was three years. And so the first year I lost about 80, 75, 80 pounds. And I was feeling great. That second year, I also lost another maybe 25 pounds. So I was at about 100 pounds lost. And I started to dabble. I started to have more and more cheat days or, you know, I'd go off. I'd have some high carb meals or days and they would lead to high carb um, cheat weeks. And then I'd be like, oh, I'll start again on Monday or I'll start again at, on the first of the month. So it's Monday, start, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that Monday. Like really, <laughs> what is Monday? It's just an arbitrary day on the calendar. I'd say, oh, I'll start again after the holidays. And then so I was about 100 pounds down in that second year. 
And I was really, I was, <laughs> I think this happens to many of us in the keto world when you discover it after this lifetime of intractable weight gain uh, or weight issues. I became really vocal about keto is the way and it's the only way and everybody should be keto and everybody should be low carb. And I was probably intolerable to my friends and family. <laughs> but then I thought, all right, well, you are going to look like a real jerk if you have been proselytizing about keto all this time. And yet, you know, I started putting back weight on until I gained about 20 or so pounds. And I got terrified that this was just a repetition of all the cycles that I've been on before. So at the end of that second year, I decided it was the holidays, it was around December. And I thought I have got to put some safety nets, a really good, strong safety nets in place to renew my vigor in this whole world and, and to recommit myself to it and to kind of to stop gap the weight gain and then hopefully continue losing weight further. So I, I needed a doctor. I live in the New York area and I didn't want to go to my old doctors because I didn't want to get, you know, quote unquote, the talk about the cholesterol <laughs> or, you know, the steak and the butter and, and all that stuff. And I had followed Dr. Tro online on social media for a while. And I was like, oh, I don't know, that social media presence. I, I was very, I didn't quite, my first impressions of him were not, were not so great, but I also needed a doctor that was low carb and keto friendly. And I actually met him for work when I was at Low Carb Denver a couple months earlier, and I found out his firebrand presence online. I mean, he couldn't be more compassionate and caring and also has a very compelling weight loss story. So I started seeing him beginning of the third year, and he taught me a very different way of doing keto and low carb that has worked for me. And so I was able to reverse the weight gain, and I have since now lost well, it depends on whose scale I'm on, but mm -hmm. over 180 pounds yeah. in total. And I can hardly believe it. Mm. I really, I can hardly believe it. I, that's the part that I, I doesn't come across in the before and after pictures is just no one is more shocked than I am to see those pictures. No one is more shocked than I am that I actually, that this worked, but I understand now how it works and why it works. And I, I have put in the work. Yes. This has been not an easy journey, but it has been the easiest thing I have ever done. It's not always easy, but it's definitely the easiest way to lose weight that I've ever tried. And the realization, of course, that it wasn't you. <laughs> it wasn't your fault right. <laughs> because it's not like no, you didn't try wasn't. hard before. Yeah. I mean, that's the irony of this, that I tried so, so hard and just got such terrible advice for so many, for decades, just such bad, bad advice. It's... It's why I want to scream from the rooftops about this from everywhere I go now, because I just, people are still giving that bad advice. Mm. You know, people, it's really the norm still. And I just want people to know that you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. It's not your fault. It's, it's like trying to put a little bit of gasoline on an open flame, that moderation nonsense. It's just, it's never going to work. You're never going to be able to put out a fire if you put a little bit of gasoline on a fire. Mm. It's just going to make things so much worse. And I wish somebody had told me this decades before. Mm. It might have saved, you know, 40 years of quote unquote wasted time. Yeah, who knows? It's That's a difficult game to play, isn't it? Sometimes I think we, we just have to be in the right place to hear the right information at the right time to make the change. You know, who knows? It's a dangerous game, isn't it, to play that hindsight, what if. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, you mentioned that Dr. Tro advocates a slightly different way of doing things. And I think mm -hmm. for most people who have been doing keto for a number of years, the way of eating changes quite considerably mm -hmm. over that time. And so I'd just be interested to hear, you know, what those changes were sure. and, and, you know, what your keto looks like now. Yeah, that's been an interesting thing too, is that realizing that your keto when you start is very different. You have to be continuously willing to tweak things and to re-examine and to figure out what works for you. So yes, yeah, so, but early on, I was really very strict in counting my macros. And I, as I've mentioned, I have an old school Weight Watcher. So I would maniacally track my macros in Carb Manager or whatever, chronometer or whatever I was using at the time, like a uh, Really, I was maniacal. I would, you know, was weighing and measuring everything. And I, 
I basically transferred my obsession with Weight Watchers points to, to macros. And I was sex- successful doing it. So it, it worked. So I was very strict keto macros, higher fat, moderate protein, super, super low carbs. But I, I, I didn't ever experience sort of the lack of cravings that many people describe when they go keto. The cravings were less because I wasn't sort of riding that sugar up and down, but uh, but I didn't experience that keto fantasy period that a lot of people describe. Mm-hmm. And then when I started working with Dr. Tro, I would show him my my food logs, and and he would look at them with curiosity and just make sure that they looked sort of okay. And and then he'd follow it up and say to me, "Well, are you hungry? Or what foods made you hungry? What foods kept you full for longer? What foods satisfied you? And what foods made you want to just keep eating them until you there was none left?" You know, and it kind of took me aback for a bit because it was was like, oh, well, what difference does it make if I'm hungry or not? I'm losing weight and I have a couple of grams of carbs left in my day to eat or I have some protein to eat. And what difference does this make? And at one point, he encouraged me to stop tracking and to start just taking notice of what foods made me hungry and what foods kept me satisfied for longer. Oh, interesting. That goes back to that intuitive eating. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where the intuitive eating started to become really useful. It was a useful muscle that I kind of pulled from to say, oh, and also learning when I was eating from physical hunger and when I was eating because I was a food addict and I was anxious, sad, happy, lonely, you know, any of all of the above. And so I stopped tracking and I thought, oh, for sure, I'm going to stop tracking and I'm definitely going to gain a ton of weight back. And, you know, and then I'll just go back to weighing and measuring my protein and my tablespoon of butter and all that stuff. Uh, Anyway, so I stopped tracking and I started just monitoring what foods kept me full and the reaction that my body had to those foods besides just the carbs, which I had done when I eliminated them. And it really was revolutionary for me in discovering which foods kept me longer. It's not to say that I don't have periods now where I, I have overeaten or, where, you know, I am a food addict. Mm-hmm. It's just, it is who I am. And wishing it not so would be like wishing that my, you know, eyes weren't the color they are or my skin isn't the color. I mean, it's, it is what it is. But paying attention to my hunger really felt revolutionary to me. And so now I eat mostly I'm not carnivore. I say I'm carnivore adjacent. (laughs) I do some vegetables because I like them, but I feel better when I eat meat and I feel better when I have a little bit of vegetables, not too much. I try to avoid sweeteners because I really feel that they make me hungrier and lead to very little satiety. I eliminated the one packet of sweet and low that I was using in my coffee forever And I think that enabled me to really get rid of a lot of cravings and it enabled me to fast for longer periods of time. So yes, that's, that's the other thing that I've added in some, I've added in some intermittent fasting. I certainly do, you know, 16 or 18 hours a day, almost every day, but once in a while I'll do like a 36 or a 48 hour fast. And that really also helped get cravings down and it helped the weight loss resume. And then about nine months ago, I started exercising really in earnest and I found an exercise that I really, really love and it has become one of my greatest joys. So I'm really grateful for that. And I credit that also with helping. I don't think that exercise is the way to weight loss per se, but it's really helped me tremendously. And even the days during quarantine where I have really, my mind has kind of decomposed and and just I just I gotta get out of this you know I have to we have to go back to normal it's always the days where I haven't worked out Mm. that I find that my mental state is just it just plummets so more than the what it does for my body it also has tremendously helped my brain and so what's this what's the exercise that you found that you love there's a, a studio near my apartment in Manhattan. It's called the Row House. And I'd been by it a million times. And I remember thinking, oh, that looks like something I might like. But I never really had the nerve to try it. I thought, oh, I'll just like, I'm just too overweight. I can't, I don't, I didn't want to be embarrassed by not being able to do it. But I thought, oh, that looks like something I might like to try. So 
last August, I just called there and I kind of told them that I was really nervous. I said, I just don't want to die or throw up in the first class. And it was a really, you know, some gyms say that there are, there are really no judgments, but this place really was no judgments. And they said, we've never had anybody die or throw up on, and, mm-hmm. on any class. So please just come take a trial class. And I went and I tried it and I could do it from the get go. And I think that was encouraging. I wasn't great at it, but I could do it. And the lights are low in the class. So you're, you know, nobody's really looking at you. And so I didn't have that sort of self-consciousness that I think many overweight people have going to gyms. And I just loved it. I did something about it. I really loved, I love the community of people that were there. They were so supportive and so caring. And so yeah, I just love these classes. Uh, and then when, right when the, the shutdown happened in New York, they reached out to me and they said, do you want to borrow? And then it was clear from the shutdown that when the shutdown was happening, it was clear that it was going to be a while. And they, they reached out to me and they said, do you want to borrow a rowing machine from us to bring home? And I jumped at the opportunity and it was an amazing opportunity. And it was really incredibly generous of them to offer it. Mm. So I have one in my apartment now and I've been able to keep up with it. And they're offering classes by Zoom for people. Uh, and I'm just so grateful that I am able to to do it. And as I said, it's really during the last three months of being sheltered at home, it's the days that I haven't worked out where my mind is to a not great place. I've never heard of that. So is, is that like a spin class, but rowing? It is. Do you have soul? You have soul cycle where you are, or you know what soul cycle is. They're like spin classes no, that are kind of, no. I think they're room, they're spin classes, but the rooms are dark and there's, the music is loud. I know what you mean. I've seen things like that on TV. Yeah. yeah. I'm in deepest, darkest rural France. That's <laughs> way too advanced, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like that, but it's, um, but it's rowing, but it's with, it's ergs, which is a, a rowing machine. So there's about 25 or so ergs in the room and the room is dark. The teachers are not nearly as aggressive or in your face as I've seen some of those other classes. They're really just encouraging and, you know, like urging you on and and really supportive and pushing you. And there's just a room full of people of all shapes and sizes. And everybody's just, you know, nobody's looking at you. Nobody's judging. It really is a no judgment place. And I really like it. What I liked that sounds about it, great. Yeah. yeah. What I liked about it is that I can do it from the beginning and that my mm. only competition is getting myself better than I was the day before. It's very interesting. It's actually, it's one of the, one of the machine. I, I don't really, well, I don't go to gyms at all now, but I, I've never really got into going to gyms, but, mm-hmm. and mostly because I don't like, yeah, I don't enjoy most of the things, but the one machine that I actually always quite enjoyed was the rowing machine so I I've never heard of this yeah you know of this group Mm -hmm. thing with rowing machines I can I can really see the appeal of that I think I would enjoy it absolutely because I I don't like I've never seen the appeal of spin classes I've never really liked that form of, of exercise in the gym but the rowing machine yeah absolutely Yeah. I mean, I don't know. This is just anecdotal, but everybody I know that has done spin classes regularly ends up at a chiropractor's office (laughs) or ends up, you know, and this is no impact. It's effort based. So Mm. you get out of it what you put Mm. into it. And also I don't want people screaming at me, like just in an aggressive (laughs) way. I just, it doesn't (laughs) appeal to me, but these coaches are, and the trainers are, are, they're not screaming at me. They're just like, they're encouraging me. They know what my numbers were the day yeah. before. And they're like, you could do it. And even by Zoom now, you know, they're just having that familiarity with people. It's not the same. I, you know, that's one thing that I can't wait to be back up and running is, is my classes. Mm. But it's been nice keeping up the community. They've started a very active Facebook community so people can touch base with each other. And then we have a couple of classes a week by Zoom to kind of keep in, in touch and to keep up our fitness. And I have to say that that has been just such an amazing joy for me in the last couple of months for my mental state, but also it's made me just, you know, what I said before about that, I my body felt like it was living in this death row. It was living a death row prison sentence. I think it's, it's certainly, it's the weight loss. Listen, I've lost 180 pounds. I can barely carry my purse now, which is weighs probably, you know, on a 
could say 40 pounds when it's, you know, loaded with stuff <laughs> or carrying groceries. And, I, and I'm like, wow, these groceries probably weigh like 20 pounds in each bag. And I'm like, how the hell did I walk around with all of that weight on my body? And so not carrying around all that weight certainly helps. I don't negate that. But the exercise has made my body so much more of a comfortable place to live in. And it it's made it I just feel so much freer. And that's the thing that really keeps me motivated now is I am so grateful that I've lost weight, but more than grateful for the weight loss is the fact that I can move and be comfortable in my body in a way that I just, I never dreamed it was even remotely possible for me. And that was a combination of of keto and also the exercise, I think. Mm. Have you ever listened to or watched Kelly McGonigal? No. Oh, who's she? I think you'd find it very interesting. The things you're saying are just making me think so much of a podcast I listened to, just have been listening to this week. And she's talking about the importance of movement and the importance of finding something that you enjoy. I'll send you the link later. I, th- yeah, I I'm think just her name it's now. just going to resonate so, so much oh, yeah. with you because all those things that you're saying and the things that you're talking about missing out, she talks about the importance of of not the importance of that it's necessary to do but there's another level that you can get out of exercise with doing it with other people Mm -hmm. and she talks about the release of endorphins and one of one of the ways to do that is to be doing it in some kind of community so that's interesting I think it's very normal that you're missing that sort of element from it um, you you know, you're still getting a lot from it, but there's that element that you're missing. And it's really inspiring, the, the things she was talking about and the impact on your mood. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so much more than what we've come to think of exercise as this word. She talks about how a lot of people see it as this sort of punishment Mm -hmm. for things that you've been doing, like eating, quote unquote, the wrong way. You know, exercise is your penance for that. And she just wants to get completely away from that and switch the perspective into finding the joy. And that's exactly what you've just been talking about. You know, I can yeah. feel it radiating off you. And and that's lovely, especially if you're someone who's who struggled with the concept of exercise and battled against it and found mm-hmm. all the sort of typical things really difficult to do and not enjoyable to suddenly find something that you really love. And you start thinking, oh, I can see why people bang on about how, you know, <laughs> exercise is so fantastic. Yeah, well, it kind of reminds me of something we talked about earlier is about, you know, you could I could never hate myself enough to be healthy. So if you're coming at it from a place of, oh, as penance, you know, how long is that going to last? It's going to last about as long as white knuckling your way through calories in, calories out, and steamed chicken and broccoli lasted. But if you're coming at it from a place of joy and satiety and health and a place of this could feel good. And I, I, you know, it does not go unnoticed to me. And when we discuss some of these things, you know, listen, I was probably my highest weight was I never saw 400 on the scale, but I know that I probably was there uh, at some point. Mm. So it does not go unnoticed for me that like, I can say these things now, and I might sound like a real jerk saying them, because I feel a little self conscious saying these things, because the 400 pound me And honestly, I have to say, I I should actually also say that even saying the words 400 pounds, like I have only just recently been able to say the number out loud, really very recently. But it does not go unnoticed to me that when I was that weight, if I heard the me now talking, I would be, I would actually probably use some very New York curse words to (laughs) describe her and be like, what the hell does this person know about me? And that's why I keep saying I'm not exceptional. Like I, I am that person and I can't believe the words coming out of my mouth, but they are the truth. But I don't, I don't want them to be off putting and I don't know how to kind of get that message across without alienating people that were where I was. Oh, I think you've done a very good job. I wouldn't okay. worry about just, that. <laughs> I, I, I worry about it all the time. I do. I worry about 
I don't want to come off as self-righteous or as, as, um, oh, I have discovered the way. And you know, I just, it really, I want to be able to get this message across because I want to, like, I, I don't, it's not comfortable for me to put myself out there like this, but I have to because I just, if, if one person hears me and says, oh, she did this, I, maybe I could do it too. Then it's redemption. Mm. It's redemption for the 40 plus years that I quote unquote wasted. And maybe it won't mean that they're wasted if I can help somebody, but, um, I don't want it to be lost that I recognize that some of the things that I say now might feel unattainable for some people because they were unattainable to me also for decades until they weren't. Mm. That's part of the evolution though, isn't it? That's part of it being so much more than weight loss. It's part of how mm -hmm. it changes everything because it, it's not just, you know, a diet that takes some weight off. It changes everything about you. It changes your mood. It, it puts you in a place where all these things are possible, where you feel like going in and asking about the exercise mm -hmm. and, and would you feel comfortable in there where, you know, you wouldn't have dreamt of stepping through the door before, but it just puts right. you in that mental space where things like all these things that you've been talking about, that what you've just been saying, that that person that you were at the start would have just told you where to go if you'd, if you'd have been standing there in front of them now. But, but that's the point. It's the, the evolution. It's, it's how it gets you to a place where these things suddenly are possible. Yeah. And how dramatically your life has changed in so many ways. In it's not, so many it's not ways. just the weight loss, is it? No, it's, um, well, it's also changed my career. It's changed. Mm. I mean, there's just, yeah, every aspect of it from the simplest to the most complex. It's changed my life in just about every way. Yeah. Tell us quickly about that because yeah, people would be interested, I think, to hear what you do. Yeah. So I, I went to Keto Fest a couple of years ago and I met the amazing Nina Teichel there. She was signing books and we started chatting. And she runs an organization called the Nutrition Coalition. And so we started chatting. She also lives in Manhattan. And eventually I started working for the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization that actively works to get the U.S. dietary guidelines changed based on rigorous mm -hmm. scientific evidence, which they are not at the moment. And, you know, I had no idea how important and influential the guidelines really are how much they dictate. Like, listen, when I was growing up, I didn't go to a .gov website. Well, when I was growing up, there really, there wasn't any websites. We didn't even have the internet yet. But, um, you know, I didn't go to a, a government agency to tell me how to eat. But, you know, Weight Watchers and every doctor and every dietitian, every nutritionist, they download those guidelines and they, that's really what they dictate. Dictate school lunch mm, it's programs. It's so pervasive, isn't it? It's just yeah. there. It's, it's just, just there. part of what's accepted. It is just taken as this is what you should do. This is the way to go. Mm. And school lunch programs, hospitals, prisons, food stamp programs, or now it's called something different, but um, they're all dictated by the guidelines. And so, you know, when I read Nina's book, when I did that first keto deep dive and I was horrified and furious at, at it, at what, what I learned. And then as I said before, I was like, why, did, how come nobody told me this? And then I would read Gary Taubes' books and, and why didn't any of the experts I know tell me this? And so, you know, just given such bad information. So, um, so I work for the Nutrition Coalition and, um, so I get to help with trying to reform government policy on that end. And then in, in addition to that, over the last couple of months, I've become a certified to become a health coach. So I'm also joined Dr. Tro's practice as a health coach. So I get to work on sort of both sides of things. I get to work on the big picture through government policy, and then I get to work one-on-one -on -one with people that are either brand new to keto and just starting out, and I help to do for them what Kim helped me do, is just give them a good education, or people that are struggling with stalls or just need support or accountability. And I think more than anything, I hope that I can also offer them some hope that um, that it is indeed possible. I just never believed it was, but I, I do feel so unbelievably lucky and grateful that I got to do this work and that I can hardly believe how I can hardly believe that I got to do it. As I said before, I said it a couple of times, you know, it's really not in my nature to be so vocal 
and be out there. And, you know, I, I, having been morbidly obese for so much of my life, I have really very much, you know, I've done some work on it, but I've really very much internalized the sort of that shame and embarrassment and to be noticed for my size. You know, I still carry those battle scars with me. You know, it's not comfortable to put myself out there and, and to be noticed for my size. But now, as I've said earlier, it's, it is redemption. It's the only way to write what I feel was just wrong. And, and how can I be quiet about it now? So yeah, that's what I do for, for work. And I'm really grateful for it. That's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I love how you can use your experience and your passion in such a valuable way to help other people and to pass it on and, and to be that voice that you were lacking. You know, you said all these people, all these experts that you see and nobody ever mentioned to you. Yeah. This possibility. And so, of course, now now you're that person for all these other people. You're that person who who will mention it and who will give them the hope that they need to change. Yeah. It's fantastic that you get to do that. I do have a little bit of imposter syndrome, which I think many people have, because I still want to lose, you know, a little bit of weight. And I think, like, who who could ever hold me up to be this paradigm of virtue, you know, that, um, you know, just, like, I'm not a skinny mini. I still have, you know, thankfully, they're, they're only aesthetic at this point, but I still have the scars of, of a lifetime of being morbidly obese. And, you know, thankfully, I'm healthy. I'm no longer pre-diabetic. My blood markers are good. So internally, thank God, everything is okay. But externally, I don't, I don't look like some, you know, virtuous, skinny, mini, gym cutie, you know, in a, a spandex leotard. But, um, but those are battle scars that are just aesthetic. So I do feel a little self-conscious about it. But then I, another case where my before and after pictures help me because listen, we are a very superficial society. And so those before and after pictures give me a little bit of credibility in, in that way. And then I remember I try to put myself back into the headset of kind of what you were saying before of how that person carried me through to who I am now. And that, that's been valuable. And also, as we said, you know, doing this at a point in my life where I'm not a kid, where I've done a lot of work, where I'm a grown up that gets it, that understands what priorities are, what, you know, I have experienced loss in my life. I have experienced people passing away or dying and, and that, you know, build, does build character, I've lost relationships, like, you know, things like that. It's, it's, um, all of these things kind of build on creating the person that you are and making you stronger. And in many ways, I wish I had discovered this earlier, but I, I think to your point earlier that it may not have taken had I discovered it earlier. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a very common thing to have that self doubt and have that if, if you are not yet at that quote unquote perfect size, that's kind of expected. I, and I know it's out there and I know there are people that, that really subscribe to that. But personally, I don't get it. I, I don't get that you have to get to this set agreed point before you can start speaking about it, before you mm -hmm. can be helpful, before you can add value. Personally, the kind of person, if I was sitting here at 400 pounds and feeling desperate, knowing that I'd been trying hard for decades to lose the weight and I couldn't do it, well, it's the person who has gone through something similar, mm -hmm. who is not quote unquote perfect. They're the kind of person that I'm going to feel comfortable with. Yeah. I'm not going to feel comfortable with somebody who's picture perfect, you know, and that picture perfect person might be perfect for somebody else, but they're not going to be for me. I agree. You know, you're the kind of person that is going to be helpful to me. So I think it's very easy to undervalue that side of it, undervalue somebody that resonates with what you're going through. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to learn to put a lot more stock in that and a lot more value in it. But I, I do understand it. I do understand the imposter syndrome yeah. side of it. But I think we need to try and get rid of that. <laughs> and it's partially why I resonated working with Dr. Cho so much, because he himself has lost 150 pounds. And he has walked the walk and talks the talk. And he gets what it is like to walk around 
in a body and what that means. Mm. And, you know, and he was a doctor doing it. So he was supposed to, quote unquote, know better, as we all were from, you know, going to all those experts all those years. But yeah, I think it's really important to have somebody that gets it. So, yeah, but the imposter syndrome is real. <laughs> and someone who's who's just a bit humble and thinks through these things, mm -hmm. you know, and is concerned that they're going to come across as a bit of a jerk. The fact that you say that, the fact that you're aware of that, the fact that you're mindful of that, all just goes into you're doing what absolutely you're perfect for. So uh, thank you. <laughs> you need I, to yeah, remember I do that. <laughs> know. If I heard myself now when I was that way, I would have rolled my eyes and given myself the finger behind my back. <laughs> but I know I've walked this walk every step of the way. So I appreciate you saying that because I don't know how else to express that to people without kicking off their mechanism of she's full of it. So um, I appreciate you saying that. It's just part and parcel of what's going to make you a great coach. I'm, oh, I'm very thankful on behalf of, of all the people you're going to be working with. <laughs> thank you, Daisy. I'm excited. Well, thank you for sharing so much of your time with me. And I know people out there are just going to get so much from this. They oh, they really thank are. Thank you for having me. You expressed concerns at the beginning before we started recording. I was saying how easy it was to edit Megan's recording. And she's a practice speaker and it, it showed when I came to do the edit. And you were saying how that was very much not you and it was not going to be my experience. But... I can completely contradict that, actually. You, oh, <laughs> you, you. Could, you could very much pass for a practice speaker and oh, it's not going to wow. be difficult at all to edit you. <laughs> that is high praise coming from you. That is really high praise. I, uh, I've heard myself on other podcasts, I think I said this to you, that I was amazed that I could have such a thick New York accent and also have, oh, this will, people in the States will appreciate this, how I could have such a thick New York accent, but also sound like a California Valley girl at the same time. So <laughs> I do appreciate uh, hearing that from you. <laughs> well, perhaps you could leave us, you've shared all sorts of useful information, but perhaps you could leave us with a top tip. A top tip. I have a couple, if that's okay. Perfect. I think there's a few things. One, I would say that to really examine once I'm assuming, you know, that we're talking to people that have mostly eliminated carbs from their world already. But once you do that, I really examine the foods that keep you full longer, prioritize those uh, other than eliminating carbs. Don't make too many changes at one time. Figure out how to eat in a way that you can be full from less food and be willing to kind of tweak things and rediscover and figure out as you go along. And one other thing is that not every experience has to be a quote-unquote party in your mouth. <laughs> not that it, you need to have a Spartan existence of like, you know, the dry steamed chicken and broccoli that we all kind of grew up thinking was the virtuous way to go. Food should be enjoyable and delicious and satiating and satisfying. And But I'm finding the longer that I do this, the better I feel keeping it pretty simple. I have periods of feasting where I go and I make like lots of indulgent keto friendly replacement foods and, and things that are, um, you know, that I can bring to holidays and, and special occasions. And then most of the time I kind of keep it really simple, a steak, some vegetables, a little bit of butter, call it a day. I find I do better with that. I do some fasting now because I like the way it feels. The food addict in me doesn't always like the way it feels, but uh, <laughs> but if I am really fighting it, I, I question myself with what's going on. And then my biggest tip, I have to say, is that if I do have a period where I have a quote-unquote cheat situation or I've I've slipped in any way, that I don't wait until some arbitrary date on the calendar to get back on track. That one cheat meal is completely, is something that you can get past. A cheat day is something you can get past. A cheat week is a lot harder to recover from. So I don't wait until Monday. I don't wait until after the holidays. I don't wait until the first of the month anymore. Um, get right back to it. And I think that has been critical for me in long-term success. Hmm. Fantastic. Well, I could carry on talking to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. And you say, 
And you keep referring to yourself as not exceptional, but I can I can say, and I think everyone listening to this is going to agree that you truly are extraordinary. So oh, thank you thank so you. much for sharing your time. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Amy. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Daisy. To get the resources and links from this show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com forward slash episodes. Please share this podcast with as many people as possible by sharing one of my links or just taking a screenshot of an episode that you enjoyed. Reviews really help raise the profile of the podcast, which gets it in front of more people, but also helps me attract a wide variety of guests. So please take a minute to leave a review on whichever podcast app or platform you like to listen on. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you. Are you enjoying this podcast? Help me make more episodes and videos by making a pledge at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash keto woman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. Don't forget to join in the fun on the Keto Woman Podcast Instagram and Facebook pages and Daisy underscore Keto Woman on Twitter. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you would like to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. This week's end quote is from The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. What you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. Bye-bye, keto lovelies. Bye.